there's a way to make an entrance. <laughs> My destiny. It was now a conspiracy of witches. Download Veely today. According to some of the witnesses, there was a close encounter of the third kind. It sounds like a B science fiction movie. It just does, but there they were, and uh, they weren't from here. These stories are some of the strangest experiences ever described in the UK. We can't tell if they're true, but they are all recounted by ordinary people. Now, they are your witnesses. This unique audio recording is of conversations between US Air Force soldiers and their superiors as they investigate a series of strange lights in the UK's most outstanding and controversial UFO encounter, the Rendlesham Incident. Yeah, it's a strange, small red light. You'll see uh, maybe a quarter to half mile, maybe further out. Still getting a reading on the meter, about two clicks. Over three nights, up to 40 US Air Force personnel from bases in Suffolk saw strange lights nearby. There are many conflicting accounts and interpretations of what actually happened in the forest. Even those who believe that something unusual happened do not all agree. Former Airman Larry Warren was one of the witnesses who came forward. On December 28, 1980, I, at that period in time, I was a security policeman at RF Bentwaters, and uh, I had a secret clearance. I was an Airman First Class, and I was assigned a D-flight. That night, I uh, showed up at 11.30 on the Bentwaters flight line for guard mount. I was in a five-man group, and I was told to move off into the forest. The big event took place on the night of the 28th and the early morning of the 29th of December. This is when the huge spaceship landed. It was about 30 foot wide and uh, multiple colors, uh, sort of spinning if you like. And uh, there were about 30 to 40 witnesses in this incident. The first two witnesses that were involved in this incident um, were told to go out to investigate lights over the forest. There is no doubt about it, some type of strange the first thing I saw was a probably 50 foot across diameter uh, yellowish green translucent object on the ground. It was probably a foot in height. It was attached to the ground. It wasn't hovering above it, but had shape and definition. Uh, you could see through it at times periodically, and the lights went from green to yellow mist, is all I can describe it as. It was like a platform, but fluid. Beyond all this was a farmer's house, and there was a light on on the second floor. There was a car in the driveway, and there were people probably outside watching this also. We do have evidence that this, inc this first incident took place, because we've got the photograph of the landing site. Um, also, uh, a, a, a patrol went out following this and took radiation readings. On the 29th of December, two days after the original sighting, the soldiers took radiation readings and mounted cameras in the area to see if they could make some sort of sense of the situation. To my right, there was a motion picture camera on a tripod and someone else had at that time a video camera filming everything I'm about to describe. That night, Larry Warren claims he witnessed alien life forms. The place of the explosion of light was this uh, triangular structured object that had like a rainbow effect on it. It had box, uh, boxes and pipes or things on its surface. It looked very heavy. It looked very old. I had this feeling it was this old thing. I don't know why. Time seemed to be at half speed. I wasn't looking at this as a rational, normal person. I, I, I don't know how it affected others. Uh, there, again, there was no heat. There was no sound that I can recall. In fact, there was everything was almost like in a vacuum. Weird. Some people ran off, had run, retreated quite quick. 
The cameras were filming this the whole while. Some people just stayed in place. I was, we were probably shocked, you know. The man in charge of the patrol was Lieutenant Colonel Charles Holt. Larry Warren remembers the encounter his team had in the forest, as recorded on the US Air Force tape. Holt's tape actually describes the beginning of this event through a scene from about 200 yards away through the trees where the red light comes in and then there's an object or something explodes and that's what they were seeing in Cape Green through the forest. Okay, we're looking at the thing. We're probably about two to 300 yards away. It looks like an eye winking at you. It's still moving from side to side. And when you put the star scope on it, it, it sort of has a hollow center, a dark center. It's, it's, this light came around this blind side of the object. I never saw the back of it. I couldn't move from the area it was in. And inside the light were these, um, the light diminished in brightness. It was a foot off the ground, and there were um, uh, what you'd only describe as children at that time. I wasn't the only one that did it. Some other people said I thought these were children. And uh, they had uh, four, four and a half feet tall, above the ground, very bright, translucent at points. You couldn't see the lower extremities. But you could clearly see the face, and it wasn't human. But it seemed like it was either a projection, or it was separate from us, or it was protected from us. It was, uh, but it was alive. There was no doubt in my mind the way these things moved, the upper extremities. There was a noise behind us at one point, and the uh, uh, arms on one of these three beings uh, raised, almost like this, in a defensive posture. It had some kind of equipment around its belt, all three of them. And I mean, it sounds like a B science fiction movie. I mean, it just does, but there they were. They weren't from here at all. According to some of the witnesses, there was a close encounter of the third kind. There was actually um, beings. These were translucent. They were almost human looking, but translucent. The witnesses were absolutely in a terrible state. I mean, these are military men. We see strange uh, stroke like flashes to the uh, rather sporadic, but there's definitely something there, some kind of phenomenal. Three or five. He approached these uh, things. Uh, I, there's been misstatements over the years that there was communication with sign language and all this, like close in the movies. It wasn't. It was definitely a visual standoff. Uh, a very uncomfortable one, so it looked, with this phenomenon. Some of the other people look totally buried, like everything they knew collapsed, it was done. We were called off by our ship supervisor back to the staging area, parking area. And it seemed the lower ranking guys were called off first, so I, I gladly left. I looked over my shoulder, my left shoulder, as I was going over the rise, and this face-off was still going on on this field called Capel Green. And I'll never forget it. And there it was. We got back to the vehicles and uh, left. We're turning around, heading back toward the, the base. The object to the, the object to the south is still beaming down lights to the ground. The witnesses were believed. They made statements. The British police were also called out where the UFO had landed and they found three indentations in the ground, which were photographed. And remarkably, in 1983, they were sent a copy of a memorandum that was written by Lieutenant Colonel Charles Holt, the very person who went out there with the patrol and investigated this case. For many years, the truth behind Britain's equivalent to Roswell remained surrounded in secrecy closely guarded by both the British and US governments. Then in 1983, after years of campaigning, the US government was forced to release official documents on the incident under the Freedom of Information Act. This controversial report is signed by Lieutenant Colonel Charles Holt, the commander in charge on the night. This memorandum was sent to the Ministry of Defense 
and it really what it what it depicts is what happened during that week it mentions the triangular shaped craft it also mentions that um, Colonel Holt was out there himself at a later date mentions the radiation readings and, and numerous other things so here we have for the very first time an official document to say that this case actually took place the Holt memo dated January 13, 1981, uh, just weeks after these events. Uh, as important as it is, on official Air Force letterhead authored by a deputy base commander of a very important NATO air base, describing phenomena that reads like science fiction, all that is good and fine, but the bottom line is I witnessed it and um, it's the biggest story ever told, really, when it gets down to it. If this case is brought into a court of law, the testimony from the witnesses and the evidence that could be brought forward would bring this house of cards down in a matter of hours. And that I stand by. Over three nights in December 1980, a series of strange lights was seen at a U.S. Air Force base near Rendlesham Forest in Suffolk. The lights were investigated by military police, but they could find no explanation for the extraordinary sights. In an official memo written by Lieutenant Colonel Charles Holt, he described his men as reporting seeing strange objects in the woods. Early in the morning of December 27, 1980, approximately 0300 hours local, two USAF security police individuals reported seeing a strange glowing object in the forest. The object was described as being metallic in appearance and triangular in shape. 150 feet or more from the initial, I should say, suspected impact point. Had a lift car to get the head on the wall. Had a pulsing red light on top and banks of blue lights underneath. The object was hovering or on legs. As a patrolman approached the object, it maneuvered through the trees and disappeared. The next day, according to Holt, the site was checked for evidence of anything unusual. The next day, three depressions, one and a half inches deep and seven inches in diameter, were found where the object had been sighted on the ground. Check for radiation. Beta gamma readings of 0 0.1 milli ronchens were recorded with peak readings in the three depressions and near the center of the triangle formed by the depression. On the evening of the third day, Holt himself reported further sightings of unexplainable lights in the sky. Sunlike light was seen through the trees. It moved about and pulsed. At one point, it appeared to throw off glowing particles and then broke into five separate white objects. The object to the south was visible for two or three hours and beamed down a stream of light from time to time. Numerous individuals, including the underside, witnessed the activity. Police were called in. After their initial examination, they found nothing significant. They decided that they too could see nothing further to investigate. Now, the British police were also called out on the night, that it, on the, the time it took place, but they, they were actually called at 4 a.m. in the morning when it was all over. So what we have now is a police officer who is saying, oh, but there was nothing there when, you know, when I went out to investigate it. But of course, it was all over by that time. The official line was that the lights had an innocent, rational explanation, possibly the beam from a nearby lighthouse, but some still think differently. Throughout the last 20 years, gradually, some of the witnesses have come forward um, and started to talk about what happened. One of the witnesses was told that what he had seen was the beam from the nearby lighthouse. Now, this is five miles in the distance. He said, no, I did not see a lighthouse beam. What I saw was an unidentified craft. And they kept on and on. And in the end, he finally said, OK, it was the beam from the nearby lighthouse. He was so upset about this that when he um, was returned back to his quarters, he actually thought of going AWOL. Official reaction from the US Air Force and the UK Ministry of Defense was the same and remain so to this day. The Ministry of Defense have denied this incident um, uh, took place. In other words, they just say, oh, it was lights in the sky. It was of no defense significant. No matter how many times people talk about it, no matter how many witnesses come forward, 
the Ministry of Defence continued to deny that this incident took place. The Ministry of Defence statement was clear and unambiguous. The lights posed no threat. The Ministry of Defence examines any reports of unexplained aerial sightings it receives solely to establish whether what was seen might have some defence significance. Namely, whether there is any evidence that the United Kingdom's airspace might have been compromised by hostile or unauthorised air activity. The judgment was that there was no indication that a breach of the United Kingdom's air defences had occurred on the nights in question, and no further investigation into the matter was deemed to be necessary. The government of Great Britain has always said these, cases, these events were of no defence significance. And I countered that by saying we had the largest backline supply of tactical nuclear weapons in NATO secretly housed in East Anglia. These objects were flying with impunity over the weapon storage areas, fi firing beams of light down to the ground at these hardened weapon storage areas, adversely affecting the ordnance in. That sounds to me like it's extreme defense significance. There are actually a number of reasons why the British and American governments uh, would not want to admit that this very powerful incident took place. Um, at, the at that particular time, it was the height of the Cold War, the bases deployed nuclear weapons that we weren't supposed to know about. There was a, a lot of conflicts going on in the world. Um, but if you actually look back on, on the historical records on ufology, you will realize that every case has been covered up, um, including, of course, Roswell. So is this Britain's Roswell? The conspiracy theorists and believers had a field day. Though they don't all agree, they felt they had credible eyewitness evidence of sightings of alien craft. But the Ministry of Defense and US Air Force still maintain that there was no threat to air defenses, even though nuclear weapons were stored nearby. There could be a whole reasons, a whole host of reasons why we're talking about a cover-up. It could, in, in its simplest form, be bureaucracy could be red tape and it's nothing more than that. I mean, our own official secrets act here in the UK buries things for years. Some of it is quite trivial and there's no reason why it shouldn't be released. It's just that the way, that's the way bureaucracy works. Again, it could be that that's the way bureaucracy works regarding the Rendlesham events. Alternatively, it could be that there was no aliens involved at all, that the events in question were something that our own military forces were experimenting with, playing around with, that went wrong. So therefore, there's a reason for hiding this. You know, military blunders in the past have been, been hidden for a long, long time. Again, if it is an alien presence, who knows the reasons why this may be kept secret. Amid the many conflicting stories of the Rendlesham incident, whether it was a lighthouse beam or other rational explanation, Larry Warren still believes that he saw alien beings that night. To the best of my knowledge, Larry's the only one that actually states that aliens were there at the time, were responsible for this, that he physically saw aliens. I'm, I'm not sure that any of the other witnesses to these events even talk about aliens. But to be fair to Larry, um, he said on many occasions that if you take Larry Warren out of the whole Rendlesham story, there is still a story there. And he's absolutely 100% correct. How do I know the truth on uh, th these events? I, I know uh, from first-hand experience, and the, the 23 years later, I'm looking for answers still. I was um, 19 years old when it happened. I'm in my 40s now, and I'm still looking. And I think everyone else that went through them in their own ways are doing the same thing. I don't know what the great truth of who they were that was there. I know the object I saw was not built in Detroit, and I know the uh, pilots weren't lighthouse keepers. Um, it's to be funny about it, but the explanations, the counter explanation, are more ridiculous than the fact that there was a non human presence in that forest on the night I was involved, and that was the third night that involved the most participants. I've named them for years, long before this was part of any part of pop culture at all. And the bottom line is, I, I wrote a, a book about this just to set the record straight on what happened to me. 
And five years later, I have never been sued for what I said or naming the people and placing them in the roles they were in at all. Larry has had some difficulties, however. The US government temporarily suspended his passport, restricting his freedom to travel. I can look at myself and say that I'm the first person ever to be an alleged whistleblower, and I am a government whistleblower, uh, to have his United States passport suspended officially, which does not happen. Our passports are given to us, and it's a matter of constitutional right, unless you're a convicted felon. I'm not. I had mine suspended for a year, and uh, with the simple reason that I spoke about sensitive defense issues on public soil, and it took a former United States Attorney General under two presidents, Ramsey Clark, to get it back. Now, I can't think of any witness over the last 50, 55 years in this subject that has had repercussions like that. Getting a definite heat reflection off the tree, about three to four feet off the ground. Yes, where the same spot is. Twenty years after the event, the Ministry of Defense released documents relating to the Rendlesham incident. But this was not enough to satisfy the believers. There were more than 150 documents, but there were really only 12 documents that were very important to the case. Most of them were just uh, letters from the public or letters from MPs. I mean, over the years, members of parliament have, have asked questions in the House of Lords, you know, but still, the Ministry of Defense denied that this incident ever was of any defense significance. I had the opportunity to interview Margaret Thatcher uh, in 1997. Um, and of course, Margaret Thatcher was the Prime Minister in 1980 when this incident took place. I talked to her about military personnel, scientists, who are now coming forward and talking about their encounters. She turned around and said, you have to have the facts and you can't tell the people. Now, why can't I tell the people? Why can't the people be told? But if you, have, if you think about it, does the government know what's going on? I mean, are they able to deal with this? What president or prime minister would want to risk their reputation by standing up and saying, yes, we have had contact.